Muchas gracias Daniel Lovino por la exposición y por los conceptos que nos ayudan a pensar en una mejor lechería. Vamos a nuestro segundo disertante ahora desde Canadá, en este segundo Seminario Internacional de Lechería, le damos la bienvenida al doctor en Ciencia Animal, Stephen Larmer, tiene una especialidad en nutrición de ganado lechero y en genómica. Él proviene de una familia de tamberos en Ontario, forma parte del grupo de soluciones genéticas de CEMEX, a partir del cual se desarrollan herramientas técnicas y de investigación para mejorar la selección animal. Stephen nos explicará cómo con genética se aumenta la eficiencia y el aprovechamiento de los recursos alimenticios en el rodeo. Adelante. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephen Larmer. I am the director of genomics and analytics with CMEX, and uh, I'm going to be speaking tonight on the incorporation of feed saved into the U.S. selection indexes, and and you know more broadly the use of, of feed efficiency as, as a genetic selection tool to, to improve efficiency of dairy cattle, to cut costs on feed in a time where, where feed costs are, are increasing rapidly. So I guess, yeah, the, the, the big question to start off is, is why is selection, genetic selection for feed efficiency important? Why should we be moving towards selection for feed efficiency? And, and the answer here is, is very, very clear. It's, it's really the, the, um, the economics behind this are, are hugely significant. Feed is by far and away the single, large, single largest expense on, on most dairy farms. And I would go as far as to say all dairy farms, no matter the, the system, whether it's an intensive or a pastoral system, feed efficiency is, is, is paramount because of that large expense of feed on farm. And improving feed efficiency can not only help improve that, that financial performance of the farm, the ability to get the same amount of milk on, on less feed or get more milk from the same amount of feed, um, but also can, can have impacts on, on the environmental impact of the dairy industry as a whole globally. Um, there's been some association studies showing that more feed efficient cows produce less manure, produce less um, CO2, more, less, less methane, you know, all, all the greenhouse gases. Um, and certainly in the same way, if we're, if we're producing the same amount of milk from less feed, it also means we are using less land um, total to feed the same number of cows. So we have, we have less, less land that we need to spread manure on. We can, we can use that manure budget more broadly. Um, and certainly it, it allows the ability to grow, um, to grow the same amount of, of human food on less acres or free up acres to grow different crops. So with that being so important, you know, what, why are we selecting on it now? Why hasn't it been a trade in the past? You know, why is, why is this really only happening now? And, and ultimately the, the reason for this is, is, a, is a data problem. The, the true biological efficiency of feed requires us to have good quality intake data. The, the, the granular data we need is, is how much food did an individual cow eat each day, especially, and, and, and being able to correct that for where they are in lactation, how much milk they're making, et cetera. And that, that biological efficiency part is, is very, very hard and very, very expensive to get good, uh, to get good data points for. If we had to do that for a whole population, it would be prohibitively expensive. You'd be spending way more money to capture the data than you could ever gain from, from improving the trait. The, the key here is that genomics allows us to record the data on a, on a much, much smaller group of animals and still get the gains um, across the whole population, across the whole global population of cattle by, by making those genomic links between those animals who are recorded and the rest of the population. So if we, if we look at this, you know, before and after genomics, before genomics, we would need to have daughters of every bull we're trying to prove with records for feed efficiency. So if we're talking about a hundred daughters per bull, you're talking about um, you're, you're talking about 1,500 young bulls that we want to test each year. You're, you're looking at 150,000 cows that you would need each year 
with feed efficiency measures. And, and when you spread that across all the bulls, you're talking about about half a million dollars per bull to have a feed efficiency trait that we could select upon, um, which is again, prohibitively expensive. We're not going to, we're not going to gain half a million dollars per bull that we select on. But with genomics, we only need to think about the total number of reference cows that we need. And the goal here is, is 25,000 reference cows. And, and really to get that data, it's a, it's a big one-time cost of, of you know, approximately $14 million with, with annual costs to update that population and keep it current. But that total cost, when we look at that relative to before genomics is, is infinitely smaller, looking at only about $300 per bull that we want to have an evaluation for. So it's, it's, it's a massive difference in terms of the scope of this problem. And, and so the economic feasibility is so much greater now than it ever was in the past. So now the, the question is, what are we really talking about when we talk about talk about feed efficiency? And and ultimately the, the process here is, is you, you have your dairy cow who, who intakes energy and they're going to lose energy from a number of different things. Some of those more useful than others, but really what we're trying to figure out is how much total energy did they intake? How much did they transform into growth and production? And the rest is really what we're trying to minimize. We're trying to find cows that can produce a lot of milk that can still grow well, but they're not losing nearly as much energy through wasteful processes, that they're, that they're as efficient as possible in those digestion metabolic process, that they don't have as much wasteful physical activity that burns energy. Um, and ultimately that they have less, less needed energy for maintenance compared to to other cattle that are producing the same amount of milk and growth so it's really that net energy that we're trying to target um, and and ultimately either improve milk performance on the same amount of feed or make the same amount of milk from less feed so kind of from a a, a simple formulaic standpoint we have two we have two components we have something called residual feed intake um, which is the energy lost as feces, gas, urine, heat, um, energy that's that's burned off because the, the cows are are spending more physical energy or they're just less biologically efficient in terms of their um, in terms of their metabolic processes. And this is kind of what we term as the biological efficiency. Um, and then we've got another piece that that's really a dilution of maintenance energy lost as, as heat for maintenance and this and this comes really with body size so larger cows need to spend more metabolic energy just to to maintain the, their normal biological functions day to day um, and so there's a second piece in in the the feed saved formula in the united states that that captures this um, and this is the feed saved for body weight component which is which is really you know an assumption, but that's been validated with a lot of data that those animals who are larger, who have greater body mass, do burn more energy just for maintenance. And so we try to capture both of these pieces simultaneously um, to really to really capture the total amount of feed saved relative to to other animals in the herd. So from that, really what, what we're trying to do is, is predict feed intake from the body weight and, and, and make an assumption on how much maintenance cost is, is needed for the same amount of milk. So here we have two cows that produce, in theory, the same amount of milk. Um, and, and really the, the predicted feed intake tells us that that animal who is smaller is going to need less energy to produce that same amount of milk, less maintenance um, for that same amount of, of production. And this is kind of the component that's been in the TPI formula for a long time, that's been accounted for in the net merit as well. The, the body weight component, which has always had a negative emphasis, assumes that those smaller cows will make, um, will be more biologically efficient as long as we select concurrently for, uh, for milk production as well. Now the, the novel piece that's been added recently and that's really, you know, in, at least in my opinion, more important from a biological standpoint is, is looking at actual feed intake and being able to, to look at this on a what's really happening standpoint. 
And so here we have the same two cows and, and we've recorded their feed intake. And, and what really can happen in practice is that that smaller animal actually eats more feed than the, the larger animal. So we've assumed for a long time that those the smaller animals always eat less. It's not always the case because the small animal may just be very biologically inefficient. They may, they may put a lot of that energy into unnecessary biological processes that are not growth or, or milk production, and, and they may not actually be more efficient. And so what we're really looking for is the difference between an animal's actual feed intake um, and, and its expected feed requirements for, for maintenance, growth, and production based on how much they've actually grown and, and produced. And, and that residual component really tells us how truly biologically efficient that animal is. So this is really what the, the residual feed intake formula uh, is able to do. We look at the dry matter, we look at the dry matter intake, we, we model for the contemporary group, and then we model for the energy outputs that are useful in, in that animal. So we look at, at maintenance of their metabolic, weight, metabolic body weight, we look at their energy corrected milk, and we look at the change in body weight. And so we try to remove those components knowing that those are biologically necessary. And we do not want those things to necessarily be any smaller, um, given that those are important biological processes. And if we take energy away from them, that animal is going to potentially suffer, um, especially, you know, this is where we can have issues with, um, with, with metabolic processes. So where we can see animals that if we select too far for lowering intake, we have problems with with transition cow issues, um, things like ketosis, things like milk fever can happen more when we, when we aren't cognizant of, um, of ensuring that there's enough energy for these, these components as well. Um, but once we've modeled for that, what we're really looking at is, is the rest, how much feed intake, um, how much feed intake was, was, you know, in, in, in took, pardon, pardon the incorrect word there, but how much did they intake? after we correct for those. And what we're trying to do is limit that residual feed intake. The less wasteful feed we can have those animals intake, the better. And then ultimately the goal here is, is really to make, uh, to make positive selection for those animals who have a, a greater proportion of their, their, intake, their, their intake going towards those important processes, the milk energy um, and the energy to gain. Um, as, as a, you know, as a function of how much food they intook. So when you look at this chart, looking at the whole population, we have kind of a curve of the amount of, of milk and gain per unit of, of feed energy. And then, and then the, the total amount of, of intake as a, as a multiple of maintenance. And you can see those, those animals above this curve here are those ones that are getting more relative milk and gain energy um, relative to the amount of, of feed intake compared to the population. And, and the key here is, th is the further right we go, we're also going to be pushing in the direction of making more milk. So we want those animals, as you can see here in the upper right, where they're more biologically efficient than we would expect for their body weight, but we're also maximizing, um, we're also maximizing the, the total production of those animals as well. So then to bring the, the two key components together here, the feed saved concept, and this, is, this was first done in Australia um, by Jenny Price and her group and launched in 2015, um, but is, is now the, the standard in the US as well, is our, our total, total feed saved formula looks at two components. One is, is the feed saved um, due to excessive body, si body size. So this is based on our type traits. Um, and there's, there's a, a combination of type traits that gives us the, the expected um, amount of feed saved for excessive body size. And then the second component, which is that biological feed efficiency component I've been talking about, which is the, the ability to limit energy wasted due to biological uh, inefficiency. And, and then those, those are both kind of negative terms, but we flip the sign in the, in the true feed saved formula. So a higher feed saved is, is indicative of how many pounds of feed you're expected to save for that animal over the course of a lactation relative to, um, relative to herd mates that would be on the same diet. So just a, a quick example here, we have two cows um, and they weigh, they weigh the same and have the same body weight composite. Um, and then we have two different milk 
milk yields that are that are fat corrected, energy corrected milk yields. Um, so based on their body weight, we have we have an expected dry matter intake for these two animals. Um, the first animal is is expected to eat, they're they're both expected to eat 17,724 pounds. Um, but the the actual on these two animals, um, the the top, the top animal ate exactly as what you'd expect, seven, 17,724 pounds per lactation. Um, the second animal, however, ate 100 pounds less per lactation. Um, and so when you actually factor that, you know, when you when you calculate that out to the um, to the the difference from expectation, the first animal. Uh, the, the first animal has a feed saved RFI of plus 610 pounds per lactation. Sorry, the, 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 the second animal, I should say, the first animal has a, a feed saved of RFI of zero because they ate exactly as you'd expect them to. The, the second animal ate 610 pounds less over the course of that, that lactation than their expectation. And so their feed saved um, with, the same, with the same body weight component is 610 pounds greater. Uh, meaning we'd expect them to be that much more efficient over the course of a lactation. So just uh, to kind of go through where the data is coming from, there's been two large research projects, um, one from 2010 to 2015, and then now one from 2019 to, to present and continuing to go. And um, the cows are collected in mid-lactation. And the reason they're collected in mid-lactation is to, to avoid um, trying to limit feed intake early in lactation. We don't want to. We don't want to limit feed intake early in lactation because we want them to get to peak milk, and we want to avoid any metabolic issues that may come with suppressed feed intake early in lactation. So we measure feed intake late in mid to late in lactation for anywhere from twenty um, from twenty eight days up to to one hundred days. Most are at least forty two days that they're collected for. Um, and we're looking, you know, we're, we're now in the in the order of hundreds of thousands of daily records for intake, dry matter, um, dry matter intake, and and then milk yield, fat yield, etc. Um, and then we're also the, the, there's also collection for body weight, body condition score, health events, and and the diet com composition is is measured and adjusted for regularly in this data. So looking at the the current RFI phenotypes in terms of number of of animals. Um, across these two projects, we're, we're at a total of about 6,542 um, that are collected through the U.S. project. And then um, th there is an international collaboration piece of this as well, um, and, and that adds a number more phenotypes um, as we go forward here. There, th and then the goal going forward is to add another 650 cows per year to that U.S. population. Um, with, with the goal of, of improving the reliability of, of data, um, also by adding international partners, and, and they've added the Canadian data since launch. Um, so, so there's there's you know a thousand or so more data points to come from from Canada that have been added to that U.S. population to, to help out as well. And and concurrently, the Canadian evaluations for feed efficiency also use the U.S. data. So they're using the same data set, although they do model the data a little bit differently. The um, the goal going forward also is to, to develop proxies for dry matter intake because it still is very, very expensive um, to collect this data. And that's why they're only able to add about 650 animals per year just because of the, the costs. But if we can develop proxies using sensor data, 3D cameras, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms, things of that sort, and we can accurately assume feed intake from, from those things that are much more much more inexpensive to record, then we can we can grow this population much faster. So that, that kind of research is ongoing. Ultimately the, the feed safe proof is expressed in, in pounds of feed safe per lactation. Um, part of that comes from the body size component and then part of that comes from actual expected feed intake based on the, the biological efficiency or the, the genetic estimate of biological efficiency of an animal. Just so you can kind of see the uh, the stats on, on the tra traditional evaluations for bulls. So these are proven bulls. These are bulls with a, with a, a large number of daughters. The, the average feed saved is um, is minus 116 in that population. So these are older bulls. The the more the, the younger bulls will have a positive average. 
Um, the standard deviation is 165 pounds with a range of, of 822 um, minus feed save points up to a maximum of 633 feed save points. And, and these reliabilities are a little out of date. I'll get into reliabilities on a later slide. So when we look into to genomic evaluations, um, the feed saved, um, the, feed, the, the average feed saved PTA of genomic animals is plus 21.4 and the standard deviation is 128. Um, so not a, not a massive range, but, but a, a reasonable range of data. You can see most of that data is close to the, the mean and the distribution there, but we do have animals um, ranging from minus 700 up to plus 900. The average reliability in the most recent um, evaluations is 38.4, so a little lower than, than most traits that we have genomic evaluations for, but that reliability is growing as we continue to add, uh, as we continue to add more data. When we look at the whole population, most animals will range from about um, minus 100 to plus 100, um, although again, th there's a, a range in general from, from minus 594 up to 453 in the data. So uh, a, a fairly reasonable range when you actually start to look at the economics. So the, the heritability and reliability, and these have been re-estimated recently um, based on based on some, some new data, uh, but the heritability of body weight is, is 40%. Those, those type traits are quite, quite heritable, quite reliable. Um, that, that predict metabolic body size and, and ultimately metabolic um, feed intake. The RFI component heritability is, is 19%, so it is quite moderate. It is, it is a highly heritable trait relative to some other, you know, health, health and fertility type traits, and, and that's a that's a really positive thing because it allows a, a smaller genomic reference population to be more impactful and to, to allow, allow for higher reliabilities. So when we look at the overall reliability of the feed save trait. Um, the average is about 38% for, for young genomic animals and 42% for proven sires. And you can see, you know, based on the weights of the two components, the, the RFI component is weighted at 65% and the body weight component weighted at 35%. Um, the reliability will then be a, a weighted average of those two things as such as well. So all the, although reliability is low, um, because of the, the high value of the trait, um, genetic progress is expected to, to, to go in the right direction and to continue to, um, to improve feed efficiency. Um, it does get a lot of weight in, in the net merit and TPI formulas for, for good reason because of the huge economic impact of this trait. So if we look at just the RFI component and correlations with, with key traits, you can see the, the, um, the chart here looking at different traits. And it's it's very clear that there's there's very little to no correlations with with any major traits of that RFI component, which again is is positive because if we put selection uh, if we put selection emphasis on this trait, we're not going to be unknowingly moving the the population in a, in an unfavorable direction for something else. Um, you can see here milk fat and protein are basically zero correlation. Same with somatic cell, slight positive correlation with productive life and livability which is a good thing, you know, as we select for this, we should expect longer living cows as well. So these, these, more, these more biologically efficient cows also live longer. Um, a, a slight favorable correlation with fertility and, and health as well. So these are all good things. The body weight component, however, kind of has the, the negative effect in the same way is that those, those um, the, 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 the body weight component is negatively correlated with some of these things, but we have a negative emphasis on body weight in the formula. So we're actually going in the right direction for these things. So we, we are seeing a, a better correlation here that, that allows us to, um, to, as we put emphasis on this, also see gains in some of these other important traits as well. So that's really good. So um, getting into kind of some of the final slides here, looking at the economic value for feed intake. So the RFI measures, um, they are uncorrelated with yield and body weight, um, which again is a good thing. And, and so what ends up happening is they get 12% of the relative value in net merit, um, but it ends up only being 4% of the relative emphasis because of the low reliability. So the, the reliability is really factored into how much how much emphasis they're going to have um, on how the whole formula, um, how the whole formula works, because proofs are regressed 
towards the mean based on the reliability. So as we add more, as we add more data to the feed efficiency evaluations, that that four percent relative emphasis will move closer and closer to that twelve percent relative value as the the proofs get as reliable as other traits. And that will take, you know, maybe ten or twenty years before we're at a point where the feed efficiency evaluations are are close to other trait reliabilities. But that four percent will will grow over time as the trait becomes more reliable. Um, the economic values for the body weight component is already accounted for um, based on correlated feed intake. That was already in the, the net merit formula before. Um, so feed saved is a combination of this, as I've said, um, but the, and, 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 you know, I should say credit to, to Paul Van Raden and Kristen Parker Gaddis for these slides. Um, but as they've as they've noted here, the the use of RFI continue, requires continuing data collection. As I've said, 650 records um, for Canada were added, and and they're going to be adding 2,200 more records from Europe, which again will increase that reliability. So you can see here um, the the relative emphasis versus relative economic value of of all of the different traits in the net merit um, as it currently stands. And, and the RFI one is really the one that stands out. You can see here that the, the relative economic value is, is quite large, but the, the emphasis is much lower. And on the flip side are production traits because they are so accurate. Um, they're the most, you know, the most, the most highly reliable traits in the, the net merit get more relative emphasis relative to their rec relative economic value. Um, so as a trait becomes more reliable, the the um, the relative emphasis will will approach the relative economic value. One of the other you know important changes that happened with the advent of these feed efficiency traits is it also led to the reestimation of of feed costs for yield components, which did change the uh, the weights on the yield components in the net merit. So we did see changes in milk fat and protein and how they're weighted in the net merit when it was reevaluated last year. Um, and that was from the data that came from this feed efficiency project. So you can see here the marginal feed cost per 100 pounds of, of milk produced um, when it was um, when it was estimated in the 2018 net merit, that was estimated at, at $7.68. Um, that, has, that has significantly dropped to, to $5.22 since uh, in, the, in the 2021 net merit. And you, you can see drops as well for, for fat and for protein um, since that, that, relative, um, that, that relative emphasis changes based on the pounds required for each unit component of output. So the pounds required to make a unit of, of feed or to you to make a unit of milk to make a unit of fat to make a unit of protein have have decreased um, in their estimates um, however you know you can see here there are very very large very large differences in estimates if we just look at a phenotypic regression a genomic regression and a sire genomic regression um, but um, you can see here that the net merit is kind of a, a, a blend of those things you know kind of an average um, which, you know, is, is kind of the conservative approach here that, that gives us the best, the best um, estimates of those, those weights in the formula. Apologize that this slide is, is a little bit small, um, but looking at the expected genetic progress impact comparing the 2018 and 2021 net merits from when feed efficiency was, uh, was incorporated, and you can see um, if you do look closely at this, even though we're adding a, a fairly significant emphasis on feed efficiency um, at, at 12 percent, you can see partially due to, to gains in data accuracy and partially due to some of those re-estimations re of, of feed costs, you can see here that for most major traits, we're actually increasing our expected genetic progress. Um, so, so we're not be, adding in the RFI has not led to a, an expected downgrade in how well we're going to to make genetic progress for other traits. Um, they're almost identical across the board, as you can see. But we see this huge gain in the the expectation of RFI, and and where where RFI where negative is better. So that means um, less feed intake per cow per lactation. You can see going from an expected genetic progress before, which was really just happening due to emphasis 
on, on slightly correlated traits and, and in, increases in milk production. Um, but you can see going from minus 0.8 per year to minus 1.94 per year, and that's in pounds per lactation. So it's, you know, it's not a huge impact, but when we look at the global, the global cattle population, um, you know, that, that one pound per cow per lactation, although it seems, you know, almost negligible when we, when we, you know, add that up over the whole world's population of cows, it has a very, very large economic impact over time. And then finally, the, the TPI formula um, has also incorporated the feed saved component. Um, so the, the feed efficiency, which before just looked at the, the body weight composite, um, now includes the whole feed saved formula. So it's including that body saved body weight component as well as the uh, as well as the biological feed efficiency or the residual feed intake component. So the, the formula is is very similar as before. It's just that the the feed the feed saved component has has replaced the body weight component. Um, but ultimately this feed efficiency component increased from about 3% weight in the TPI um, in previous versions up to about 8% in the current TPI. So uh, looking at the two indexes, TPI has about 8% weight on, uh, on feed efficiency and the net merit has 12%. So just in, in quick summary, um, feed save combines body weight and residual feed intake to measure the, the ability to reduce total feed intake. Um, the selection for feed save will result in, in smaller cows, but if we, if we select enough on milk, fat, and protein, we should still see positive gains in those traits. Um, so, so we're not sacrificing genetic progress on those traits. However, we, we should, in theory, see uh, a slight decrease in, in stature in, in total size of our dairy cattle going forward. RFI is, is heritable, uh, but the data set is still small. So, so reliabilities are much lower than most traits that we look at for normal genetic selection. Um, but even with that low reliability, we can still make significant gains. There still is a lot of genetic variation to be harnessed in the population. And as we continue to, to select for this trait, we should, um, we should grow our, our reference population, have higher reliabilities, and be able to make even faster genetic progress. Both the net merit and TPI have adopted feed saved into their indexes, and, and both are put in there at, at moderate weights, as I said on the, on the previous slide, at 8 and 12 percent. Um, so, so moderate weights, but again, we should see genetic progress and it shouldn't affect our ability to select for other traits. Yeah.